Okay, so I've invited uh, Donna Yacht to come today. Uh, Donna and Phil are some of our closest friends here in uh, Oregon. We've known them for most of the time we've, we've lived here. Um, I've had the privilege of being one of their pastors, and I've invited Donna to come today to share her story. Uh, having been born in one of the camps in Idaho uh, during the, uh, the war. And as I mentioned before, um, she's going to be sharing uh, a message of optimism and faith that got her and the rest of the family through a difficult time and really even to their benefit. Thank God, God was able to use that. So um, we're going to, I'm going to invite Donna to come up, and then uh, she, she has some things. We're going to do a DVD at one point, and she has some display here. So, Donna, if you're ready, let's welcome Donna Young. what it must have been like for my parents the day they posted the announcement on the posts outside that all Japanese, both the what they called alien Japanese as well as Japanese American citizens had to report to the, um, the uh, what they called the assembly center. So I asked my mom one time, how did you know what you had to do? And she said, well, one of the ways was they would go around and post these notices in the Japanese neighborhoods telling them what they were to do. They would just post those uh, on the wooden uh, telephone poles or whatever. And so um, they, what they were told following um, President Roosevelt's you know, edict that all Japanese were to do this, then um, they had a, a little bit of time to assemble. And in the case of the people in Oregon, they were to report to the assembly center, which was uh, the stockyards, which is in that Jansen Beach area. And now is the, uh, I think it's the expo uh, center. Uh, at the time, they were stockyards, and they had simply washed it, hosed it down. Uh, so that's where they, you know, they would have all the stock, the, the cattle and horses and chickens and whatever they were going to be selling, the livestock. So they just hosed that down. It's like going to the um, the state fair or county fair where the the animals are kept, and they had hosed that down and put in some kind of flooring. There were no doors. You know how the stalls are at the fair. And they would just hang blankets in, in, in front of these places. So each family, depending on the size of the family, that was the size of the stall they got. Um, and uh, that was, of course, uh, following the attack uh, on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. So there was a, a, this feeling of hysteria and uh, so all the Japanese were to report. At first, there was concern about the uh, Japanese who were from Japan. Uh, not so much about the citizens. Not, and the, the citizens were called Nisei. That's what my parents were, Nisei. So my grandparents had come from Japan. They were called Issei. That means first generation. Nisei means second generation, second generation to be in the United States. So as things got worse and following that attack, then it was not just the Issei they were concerned about, they decided all Japanese, especially on the West Coast. And so this was not, the edict by President Roosevelt 
was not really to intern the Japanese. It was simply to say Japanese were not to be allowed on or near military uh, installments or anything to do with the military. Japanese were to be kept out. Understandably, I suppose, in a way, but he, it was left to the military to decide what that meant. And there was a General DeWitt who decided, well, um, <clears throat> you know, we can't be testing every one of these people so about their loyalties, so we'd better put them all in. That was the easiest way. Uh, and so uh, saying that it was for the protection of the Japanese themselves, they said, we, you, you have to report to the assembly center. We want to make sure that you're safe. Uh, and many people, including my parents to some degree, uh, accepted that. They bought, they bought that reason. Uh, they were told to report to the assembly center uh, by a certain time. Uh, it was April, I think, that they had the edict from President Roosevelt came out in February. They had to report in April with only what they could carry. In the case of my parents, that was, um, uh, and my parents had the two of them and then my older brother, who was only two at the time. I wasn't born yet. My mother had lost her mother just before the attack on Pearl Harbor and she considered that a blessing from God. She had, she had actually prayed that, that her mother would, be, would go. She was, she was ill, and, and they, she was quite certain, my mom was quite certain that if they took her, they would not see her again, and she would be alone in where, wherever they took her. So um, God answered that prayer and uh, took her in November. Um, now, what I'm going to talk to you about today is really a, li a little bit about my story, but it's uh, really more my family, my parents' story. Uh, I didn't suffer really anything, in all honesty. Um, and the other thing I, I really want to stress is that our story is just one. I mean, there would be many others in my situation or my family's situation who would say, no, no, it wasn't like that. Oh, no, no, it was much harsher. Ah, oh, no, no, we, we had this situation. The, the general, our general experience was, of course, the same. But just like each of you here, uh, your family, your, your stories are different. So we're all having breakfast together, but we're having a different order, probably. And uh, so you might describe the breakfast differently from, from how I would or how your, your friend would. Um, so just keep in mind that what I say is really what I learned from what my parents experienced. So <clears throat> following that edict, all right, they were assembled in the stockyards, uh, but because of the conditions, uh, a lot of people were getting sick from, they, would have, they had dysentery and lots of, you know, uh, diarrhea and that kind of thing, and my parents really wanted to get out of there as soon as possible because of my little brother, my younger, <laughs> my older brother who was little at the time. <laughs> and uh, so, the reason they were put in the assembly with the center was to, they had to build the other, the relocation camps. They called them relocation camps. And uh, so until those could all be built, and there were 10 of them, scattered about in remote areas of uh, Oregon, Washington, not so much in Oregon, uh, in Idaho, California, Arizona, Wyoming, and so, and even one in Arkansas, Utah. Um, so until those could be built, they were to wait here. They stayed for about two or three months, and they were asking for volunteers to go and help build the housing uh, 
Uh, and my father, who had never built anything, I, I, I mean, very important, he said, oh, oh, I, I'll, I'll go because I'm, I'm a good carpenter. Would you have? <laughs> and um, he, they just wanted to get away from the conditions here in the stockyard. So uh, he, they took him and my, my mom and my brother to Tule Lake al al along with other volunteers. Tule Lake in Northern California, pretty isolated area. Uh, and there they were, of course, behind you know, barbed wire and they had guards, they had armed guards. Uh, it's, you know, it's like asking, well, basically it was. He had to build, he was helping build his own prison. Now, before that, my dad was, he was born in Portland, so was my mom, but my dad, because his father died when my father was still just a child, um, his mother, my grandma took him, took my father and his little sister to Japan by boat. So my dad was born in 1912, around 1915, 16, she took her two young children, because now she was a widow. And they had come from Japan. Her husband died young here. Uh, she had no way of supporting them, uh, if, if taking care of children and working. So she took them home to her mother and left them there, left her two young children there. She returned to Oregon and is, was basically like a migrant farm worker and she would send money back to Japan all right so as my father grew up in Japan <clears throat> when he was about <clears throat> 14 because he was an American he had dual citizenship he decided and probably the family decided for him he needed to come back here because they were starting to um, uh, take young boys to the military. Japan was becoming extremely militaristic. They'd had success in the Russo-Japanese War. And that made them feel very, very confident uh, that they could you know, conquer these different areas in, in Asia. So my father's family decided he would come back to the United States, which he did. And now he was with his mother, whom he no longer knew, and who well, he couldn't speak any English, that's for sure, and she barely could, probably. Um, but he was, so he was about 14 or 15, and um, he couldn't speak English, and so they put him into, he went to about two years of school, public school, while working, because he was 14, he was working and helping his mother here. He had his little sister, and he had family now in Japan that he was helping they would send money home. Um, but he couldn't speak English, so they put him in school, and he, they put him in second grade, and he was 14 or 15. And that was the immersion method. And <laughs> uh, no ESL, uh, no special ESL classes. And so he, and he learned very well, and, and the funny thing is I came across some papers that, that uh, he got some certificates of award for his, his good penmanship and for his good grades. Uh, but Japanese was always sort of more his first language because he, even though he learned, lived to be 98 and his English was good, still Japanese was the language that he had, had learned formally. He could read and write, a uh, difficult language. Um, anyway, he was an American citizen. Now this was a difficulty for them. His mother and his blood relatives were in Japan. His family, his wife and child, and he were here. So it's kind of a no-win situation, really. But he never, nor did my mother, she didn't really know Japan, my, they never felt like, oh, maybe they'd better go to Japan. Oh, Japan was their, their country. Never, never, despite everything. So they ended up in the uh, war camp, in the, in, the, in the prison in, in Tule Lake, California. They were there for, from I think 1940, 
to, let's see, we went in April. So toward the middle of <clears throat> the middle of 1942, um, then they went to Tule Lake, and then my father decided this is terrible. Uh, not the conditions so much, but the fact that they didn't know how long they'd be there. See, this is the hard part. They never really complained much to us at all. I mean, in fact, my brothers and I didn't really know what that was like for them. I grew up thinking for a long time, when they talk about camp with, their, with, with my aunties, they talk about, remember when we get together and play cards and Rose so-and-so was such a bad loser when we'd play cards and oh, remember when we got together for our sewing class and this, and I thought, oh, they lived in some kind of camp that was a lot of fun. See, they, ne cause they never said, boy, that was terrible. Remember when that guard came and beat us or remember when they, we got shot at? No, I didn't know it was like that. And so, um, so they, they were there, but the problem was, as I reflect on it, it must have been so scary. My mom was only 26. My dad was 29, not even 30. And off they went. They were sent off to Tule Lake. And um, they had never been given a trial. That's the thing that all of the Japanese at that time uh, were never, never given a trial. See, even our worst criminals get a trial. And then when they're sentenced, they know what the sentence is. And that might change, but for them, they never got a trial. They never got a sentence except, I mean, uh, you know, knowing how long it would be. So there they were, not knowing how long or how it was going to end. My father was very antsy about that. He wanted to get out. They, they had jobs in the camp. My dad was like a carpenter. My mom worked as a laundress. And uh, they got paid a little bit. My mom said she got paid $16 a month. And my dad got paid $18 a month. They had housing, very rudimentary housing. And they had got fed uh, a lot of mutton, my mom said, and a lot of fish which I always wondered, gosh, she's Japanese descent. She doesn't like fish. That was one of the reasons. And she always would say, lamb, is this lamb? Oh, no, no, I can't eat it. And because she couldn't, I couldn't. I, I, I thought, no, I'm never going to try that. I raised the lamb before each lamb. That made it even worse. I would never eat it. <laughs> uh, so they were there, but when, because my father really wanted to get more, have more, have some kind of future for the day that they might be released. When a man from Eastern Oregon, from Burns, Burns Hines, Oregon, from the Edward Hines Lumber Company came to recruit a railroad, a, a railroad uh, crew. And he'd heard, they heard that Japanese uh, were very good on the railroad. And so they went to the camp and said, look, we will take responsibility for these prisoners. We need them on the railroad. Our they, we, we pay them more. They'll get paid more than they, they did in the camp, in the internment camp. Uh, so he asked, they asked for volunteers. My father was one of maybe about six who said they'd go. That meant my mom and my brother, older brother, <coughs> had to stay there. They got separated. So my dad went directly from Tule Lake to the camp, to the railroad camp in Eastern Oregon to work on the railroad. And my mom was so shocked that he would do that. What? I mean, she always says, it. what? You don't know anything about railroads. All you know is that they go choo choo, chug chug. And you're going to go work on the railroad? Do you know how heavy the ties are, the rails are? You, you are crazy. Well, he said, I can't help it. I've got to go. We can't stay here under these conditions, not knowing what's going to happen. 
So off he went, and my, by then my mother was pregnant with me. Uh, and there was dissension within the camp itself, with, among the Japanese. They weren't all of one mind or spirit, you know. Uh, some of them felt very, were very indignant, as they should be, uh, resentful, and felt that, what, we're American citizens. This shouldn't be happening to us. So they were, they were, there were protests. And, but within the camp, there, see, like my father felt like this. Look, we don't have anything to fight back with. And the best thing to do is to just comply. Let's get along, let's get through this. And I think the Oregon and Washington people tended to be more like that, whereas the Californians who'd been here perhaps longer, many of them were, you know, had land and more to lose perhaps. They felt that this wasn't right <clears throat> and they uh, had demonstrations and so forth. They, this did not go well with their, their fellow inmates. So what they ended up doing was separating them. And they said, in fact, they even, the, the U.S. government said, okay, those of you who feel loyalty to Japan, you may go. You can go. We don't guarantee your safety. But if you want to go back to Japan, well, then you can go. And so what they did was they separated these different factions. My mother ended up being sent to Idaho. Now, they all had to swear <laughs> take an oath of loyalty, which is kind of interesting in itself because, you know, nobody would come and ask us, would you, would you sign here that you're loyal to the United States? We would. I mean, I would. I'm, I would be loyal to the United States. But you, they had to prove it, um, swear to it. And so they separated the, the different, uh, into, into different groups according to how they felt, uh, where, which they felt more loyalty toward. And so my mother went to Idaho, to the camp in Idaho called Minidoka. And that's where I was born. My father was already uh, out on the railroad camp in Eastern Oregon, which turned out to have harsher conditions <laughs> than the internment camp because there was nothing there. No electricity, no running water. They had to build their own, they built a bunkhouse and so forth. They took, there were, I don't know, four or five men plus a cook that went there. So as it became evident <clears throat> that the US government now was starting to admit that mm, maybe they didn't have to imprison all of us, and they couldn't really financially support this big project of 10 camps. See, there were, I don't know, 10,000 people in almost every one. So there's over 100,000 people that they were supporting. They decided they could let them, let us leave if we had a place to go. And my mother did. Uh, so she took my brother, and by then I was born. I was born in December of 43, so I was about four or five months old, and she took us to join my father in Eastern Oregon, which was shocking to her. She, she thought, what, what have you gotten us into? And it's better, in fact, they wanted, she wanted to go back to the prison camp, but once you were out, you couldn't. They wouldn't let you back in. Um, so there she was. No electricity, as I said. It burns, if any of you have been there. You should go in the winter time. <laughs> um, and my dad had to build a house. Once he knew my mom and the rest of us were coming, he built a house. But he had to do his job on the railroad, and the company let him build a little house for us on his own time. They actually supplied the lumber, because it's a lumber company. Uh, so he built a little house because, you know, see how that works? See how God works? He trained him to be a carpenter in the prison camp. So now he's out 
and he could build, however simple, a house for us. And that's what, what he did in his spare time. And there were many, many, many train wrecks during that time because the railroad was not, was poorly made in the first place. The rails were, were not well laid. The ties were not treated, so they rotted. Lots of train wrecks, so the men were called out uh, during the night a lot. Um, so at any rate, my, my mom uh, took my older brother, who was by then four, and me, I was just months old, and we went to join my father. Uh, she couldn't believe the conditions, and she thought, well, this won't last long. It can't. Uh, but it, they lived there, they, they moved there in 43, no, 44, and they stayed in the camp for 30 years, and then um, they stayed in, they moved into town, into Burns, and lived, stayed another 30 years, 20 years. So they lived in that community that they feared so much at the beginning uh, for that whole time and became really, really good friends with many people there. And that's where my dad always considered home. Um, so their war experience was certainly not good. But like my mom said, we were poor and we didn't have a lot to lose. So it didn't affect us as much as it might have affected those who had more to lose in terms of finances or possessions. What she lost was, there's a little clip we'll show you, but she lost friends, not permanently, but you know, people were wary and the people she thought were her good friends couldn't stand by her uh, as much as they might have because they were afraid of how, what they would be thought, how they would be thought of. Um, bad feelings toward the Japanese were already brewing. Uh, it didn't all start with Pearl Harbor. But uh, when that, when Pearl Harbor happened, then, then it was, uh, there was a big split among friends. Uh, so she, when they left, they could only take what they could carry. They had possessions, but they had burned almost everything that might tie them to Japan. Because the FBI, they actually were going into places and checking. My mom had actually been reported as having a radio downstairs and that she might be sending, uh, you know, doing shortwave messages. And so they, they some, someone reported that. and came to her house and she knew she didn't know anything about it and she always bragged sort of that she didn't really know Japanese. She knew Japanese uh, to speak, uh, it was what we call, you know, Nisei Japanese, which was a little different from standard Japanese because the, she learned it from her parents. <clears throat> but uh, so she could speak like that, but she was not really that fluent in Japanese. But there was that feeling of being um, you know, like being suspected uh, of, of being a spy. That feeling was hard. And the fact that they, <clears throat> what little possession they had, they, personal things, they couldn't take with them. No cameras, of course, no radios. And no, none of their, their little mementos. So what they did was, if they could find an American uh, Caucasian friend who would keep their things for them, they asked them to do that. And But when they got out, they found that a lot of things were missing. Um, and But then could she say, you know, I think that's my mother's favorite dish on your <laughs> mantle. <laughs> she couldn't say that. No, so it was those little things that hurt her more deeply probably than anything else. Now, while I was in, I was born in the camp and there are no pictures of me as an infant, of course. And maybe they weren't missing anything, although. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, so no, no pictures of me as an infant because they weren't allowed to have a camera. And uh, 
the amazing thing is some people actually in the camp they made their own radios I don't know how people do this people are amazing they made their own radios they made cameras they did paint there there are many things that people could do they Japanese are very you know ingenious about making things grow in the desert and it is amazing what they what they grew in those camps in fact some were required to to produce their own food in some of those remote areas um, well my my parents I think the legacy to me and my brothers was the fact that they I've said this so many times to my friends but it's the thing I'm most grateful for it and that is that they never spoke badly about the US they knew they'd been given sort of uh, you know hadn't been treated exactly fairly still my father's attitude was well what are you going to do war is war and it's terrible and we we, we cannot expect people to act like they normally would so the fact that the American government and the Americans were treating the Japanese like that was in his mind uh, it not it wasn't good but it was understandable so what are you going to do well get over it and keep you know do the best you can don't make a big fuss when you don't have any Thing, you, you cannot really fight back. So figure out how to survive and get through and do the best you can. That was his attitude. So my brothers ne and I never grew up thinking, boy, white people are like this, or oh, the American government did this. There were some Japanese who felt that, but um, and maybe still do. But uh, we, <laughs> we never. And that's not to say it was a party. Okay, I told you that they lost things, they lost their dignity, they lost their freedom. Um, but, and there was, of course, some discrimination. And when we got out, my mom was very afraid for us kids going to school in Burns. We were the first Japanese, for sure. The only non-whites were, other non-whites were the Paiute Indians weren't treated very well either um, but we my brothers and I honestly never felt out and out discrimination we never went home crying because somebody called us a Jap that it, I, it never it, it happened occasionally but we always honest we always considered the source and, uh, and, and one time, I know my youngest brother uh, said that his friend, well, they were in a class, and the teacher had been in the service, had been in the war. And he one day slipped, and he, well, he said the word Jap. He wasn't talking to my brother. He just said, during the war, this is what happened to him when the Japs attacked. And he said, but my friend stood up and said, Norman is not a Jap. <laughs> not that he'd been called one, but it's almost like that. We, we, uh, my parents always told us, you know, to just do the best we could, do well in school, and, and we would stand on our own feet that way. If we started pitying ourselves, then there wasn't going to be any end to that. Uh, and I would say that that is the one thing that was really good. You see, we lived so, in that re remote railroad camp uh, for so long, and then I went to school, and I was so scared because I'd never been around white people very much. And I certainly didn't have any white people little kid friends and so when I got to school and I hadn't gone to kindergarten um, everybody seemed to know each other but I didn't and I just sat there <laughs> really quietly I was so I wouldn't play with anybody at recess well so whose fault is that you know that wasn't the kids fault they didn't know to come and you know well but I I guess something was wrong because I wouldn't eat lunch 
I was so scared. I'd take my lunchbox home with one bite of a sandwich eaten, and I'd take it. my mom was so worried. So behind my back, <laughs> she had gone to the teacher and said, look, what kind of a teacher are you? Can't you see that my daughter isn't doing well? And, and so one day, I didn't know that. One day I go to school, and these kids all surround me, and they say, oh, Donna, Donna, and I was so little, and oh, Donna, Donna, do you want to play? And I thought, huh? And, and oh, Donna, okay, we're going to play house at recess time, and you'll be the baby, okay? And I said, ah, okay. And so they're carrying me around, and I'm thinking, well, what, what has happened? I didn't know what, that my mom had gone and talked to the teacher, and the teacher wasn't aware of it. So she spoke to the other kids, and oh, they were so, so nice to me. But it wasn't their fault. They weren't discriminating against me. I wasn't outgoing. I didn't, you know. Well, um, I don't want to, to make your breakfast too long. Um, I just want to, to say that one of the great strengths I, w was the fact that uh, when I went to school, I was one of only two kids in my class who could read. And it wasn't because my mom forced me to read, but when, I, when you live way out in the country and there's not much to do, then you do whatever. So I learned how to read. And you know what? I, I always think that it's, um, so I appreciated my, my friends in first grade. Because when they found out I could read, they thought that was so great. And the teacher, I could still, the teacher would put a new word on the board. And she'd say, now, children, what do you think this word is? And, and they would say, I can still hear this voice. I don't know. Ask Donna. She knows how to read. And, and they said it not in a jealous way or anything, but they, I could tell that they respected me for that. And I thought, wow, do you see, if you have something, some, some strength, and you, not that you're going to flaunt it around, but if you have a strength, then people do appreciate you for that. And they, they knew I'd done that on my own. And so I was always sort of proud of that and grateful to my parents for having encouraged us to always get a good education, be good uh, in school. Um, as I said, we lived there until I graduated from high school. And uh, because of the war, this is the strangest thing. Uh, our lives changed. It could have been bad. It wasn't great in some ways, but you know what? Uh, it is what you make of it. And had we stayed in Portland, because my parents were not rich and they were not well, you know, well educated. Uh, my dad grew up in Japan, and when he came here, he had two years of schooling. My mom graduated from the Poly Girls Polytechnic School at the age of 15, and that was as much education she had. But she could write, even if she were alive now, she died last year at 98. If she were here now, she could correct our grammar, and there's plenty to correct these days. <laughs> she can correct spelling. She can correct uh, punctuation because they really learned it in those days. And uh, so they had a little education, but that was the reason, the driving force for them to get, to have my brothers and me be educated. Had we stayed in Portland just as if the war hadn't come along, then we would have lived in a more ghetto situation, not in a bad way, but it's just that there would be these strong communi communities of Japanese, hard to break out of, especially if you are of a certain economic social level. Japanese is a highly structured society, difficult for one class to get in, break into another, okay? So that whole tradition carried over here to the States. Now, it wasn't as much, it wasn't as strong as it was in Japan, but certainly it existed. So my parents would never have been able, under those conditions, to send us to school, to college. But as it was, my three brothers and I uh, were all able to go to college because 
you know, the war came along, upset the fruit basket. Now everybody's on their own. You, you're going to, you have to make it. And then we did. And we didn't have any Japanese friends. We did have very few Japanese friends um, to, uh, at, as we grew up. We were in that isolated area. Um, the U.S. government realized their error. Uh, I, and through the work uh, of some of, of Japanese Americans and uh, many uh, others in the government, they realized we have to do something to make up for this. And that's, uh, as many of you may know, the Japanese Americans were given um, a monetary, you know, reparations. So each one of us who was in the camp received $20,000 from the government. And they started with the oldest. Now, um, I think I did not deserve that. But they had to have a way of deciding who was going to get it or not. So that whoever was born there, whoever lived in the camp, uh, they, we received $20,000 each. My two younger brothers didn't get anything. They were born in Burns. Um, and one of the saddest things that happened was when I was a teacher in Iowa, I received a letter from a man uh, who resented the fact that Japanese got the $20,000 each. And you know what? I don't blame him in a way. I don't blame his, his for the, those feelings. Um, and so because to him it was, I'm just, I, I just want to read a part of his letter. He wrote to me from following an article he saw in the paper where they'd interviewed me about how did I, now the money was finally coming in. How did I feel about that? <laughs> and I said, well, I didn't do anything to deserve that. My parents did, but $20,000, yeah, it sounded like a lot of money, but then you have to think of what they lost and so forth. Well, this poor man, <clears throat> he said, I was 19 years old, married with a daughter three weeks old when I was drafted. I received $50 a month. Uh, and I had to pay for insurance, uh, $10,000 of insurance for, out of that because uh, in case I died. Uh, and so he was sent to the, he was sent overseas uh, and he had, you know, for three years separated from his family, lived under terrible conditions, lost friends and so forth. And now he's saying, why are you getting this money? You were in a camp, you had housing, you had food, you, you had, you know, shelter, you were taken care of. How, how can you justify that? I got nothing. Um, I got discharge paid. And I felt for him. He was one that we would call a hero. You know? And Japan was certainly not faultless in that war. They treated their enemies terribly. My parents were, by comparison, in the internment camp, they were not treated harshly at all, by comparison, okay? And my mom had remembered how a soldier helped her when she was pregnant and had, had to move from California to Idaho, pregnant with me, and she remembered and spoke so fondly of him. Um, and things like that, you know, it just, makes you see how the world is. But uh, through it all, uh, Japan and America became friends fast. Within 20 years, I was back in Japan as a student. Couldn't believe that. How could I be there? And I asked a friend, well, who do you look up to in Japan? Who do people in Japan look up to? His answer, and I'm sure some of you have heard it, General MacArthur. General MacArthur their hero. <laughs> it's like, well, the world is topsy-turvy. Um, and, and along with the, the monetary, uh, well, payment that we received, uh, we received a letter from George Bush, the first George Bush, uh, a, a letter of apology saying this, a monetary sum and words alone cannot restore lost years or erase painful memories. Neither can they fully convey our nation's resolve to rectify injustice 
and to uphold the rights of individuals. We can never fully right the wrongs of the past, but we can take a clear stand for justice and recognize that serious injustices were done to Japanese Americans during World War II. In enacting a law calling for restitution and offering a sincere apology, your fellow Americans have, in a very real sense, renewed their traditional commitment to the ideals of freedom, equality, and justice. You and your family have our best wishes for the future. Sincerely, George Bush, signed October of 1990. Um, and uh, as I said, it wasn't the money. $20,000 cannot even buy you a car now, and, and not even a full year, one year of education, of college, sadly. Um, but uh, it is, as my mom and dad said, it's what you make of it. Um, and what I found in terms of faith was I did not know this until many, I found it like, five years ago, going through papers of my family, and my parents, um, these two cards, these are certificates of dedication. Um, they dedicated me to the Lord in, in, in the prison camp, in the, in the church. And um, it's signed by the Japanese, pastor, and then there's um, a more official one to make it really real. Um, this is signed by an American pastor, I mean a, a Caucasian pastor. <coughs> but I didn't know that. I didn't know they dedicated me in church to the Lord. And I didn't follow the Lord for a long time. And my mom just had this picture of Jesus in our house all the time, and she never really talked that much about him. But he was always there. And when, when I'm after, I'm 50 years old, beyond, uh, I, he, well, he was always there. He knew where I was. I just know where he was. And then I found him. And then he said, see, Donna, I was there all that time. And it, my dad was 98 when he, he died, uh, almost four years ago. And um, he wasn't a Christian. But I, literally on his deathbed, I said, okay, I've got to do this. And I went in when he was having a lucid moment, and I asked him, Dad, you, you have to follow Jesus. Wherever you go, you've got to follow Jesus so we can see you again. I thought, Jesus told me to do that. And I thought, I can't talk to him about Jesus now. And he, and he said, yes, yes, you can. I said, no, he won't know who I'm talking about. And he's, he's, he's on his last breath, right? No, go get my picture. The picture your mom always had. And I said, I don't know where it is. Yes, you do. It's in her bathroom. <laughs> go get that. So I took it. I brought it. And, and I talked to my dad. And it was, I don't know what he understood. But I said, Dad, you know him? Mm-hmm. And I said, Dad, you have to go with him, OK? And he said, mm-hmm. OK, then. Let's do it, he said. <laughs> And that was it. That was, those were the last words he spoke. Um, and so I say, yeah, faith didn't play this part in my life as I was growing up, like you know, my mom telling us about Jesus all the time. But uh, you see, it, it was there. And, it, and, and now I can look back and see what a fort, because my mom was a Christian. But then she was strong in that way. But she never, we could never go to church on a regular basis. We lived too far out. Um, but uh, life is what you make of it. You decide to make, you know, lemonade out of lemons, how that goes. And um, things go right. And Jesus, for me, I'm not saying it's for him, but for me, it turned out to be, you know, a light that I didn't recognize for the longest time. Now I reflect on it and I say, oh, thank you. And I thank my parents so much. So this really was more their story than mine. Thank you for listening. We have just a little short bit of a, of a, 
uh, little documentary my nephew made and put it on this DVD. Uh, it, it's the, my mom, when she was 97 years old, then last year she died at the age of 98. Um, and so just, you can see some parts from the, the internment camp where I was born, just little snippets of things that he was able to put on this DVD. <coughs> My name now is very Eki, but I started out at Lakashima, Lady Lakashima, September 11, 1915. But we had a nice life, even with the war, we managed. And so I uh, lost more was the people who said they were my best friends. They quit talking to me. Because not because they disliked me, but if they were friendly with the Japanese, any Japanese, why well, they would be in trouble. You know what I mean? And they're trying to say Jap lovers and things like that. And so they told me, they said, Daddy, we love you just the same. You know? And that brings tears to my eyes that so many still favored us, even if there was a war between our countries. I would say that internment camp that you might read about in the movies, excuse me, they are a little exaggerated and maybe not, but maybe we were just fortunate to be in the camp that we were. We hear both like, did you hear somebody got shot because he was trying to get, get out of there? But that, that might have been just a problem. I don't know what all the others thought, but I thought I was living pretty good. And to the lake was, we didn't have too much because we just had a cabin, you know, well, barracks and a room in the barracks, but no matter where you go, you make the best of that, and I think. And so the people who had money, they were, I don't think they were any worse off than we were. No, we were any better off than they were either. I didn't know the rich people, but uh, life is what you make it no matter where you go. We were poor to begin with. So it might have even been better. We had hot water when we wanted it. We, you know, we had a big water. I didn't lose anything, baby. The only thing I lost was my, what we call my own home. But being there made us realize that we have to give the kids a better education. And to do that, you have to work. And so the kids will have to go through what we had to, to get a food on the table. Although we were getting fed real good. And they had their uh, time that they could go have a party and this and that. You wouldn't even know. It was just, to me it sounded like just a big gathering. Because we were fed three times a day. If you didn't like the food, that was your hard work. And then they had, uh, clubs for the young people, and they had dances, and they had parties too. It wasn't all the switch hitting and kind of turning around a different way. It wasn't that time. The people, I think the people were all asked not to mistreat us, because a lot of us were, you know, citizens. <coughs> and, uh, but in a way it was for our protection. Because if you had a neighbor who didn't like you, he could set a house on fire every day just to get rid of us. So, so I worked to the laundry and take all the what uh, called cooks and the well the cooks ate their little caps and jackets and did their laundry. 
I, I got paid uh, eighteen dollars, you know. And Frank, uh, he got about that much too, but he didn't stay in the camp very long. He heard the work of the road, so he left right away early. But, but I didn't see anybody who was unhappy. I think unhappy people would have been happy anyway, you know. I think we, now I got this, if a parent could have stayed in the grocery store, maybe that's all he do now, or maybe he owned him in the grocery store. But now he worked hard, and they all worked hard. They all the Japanese worked hard. And then there were young ones who really liked to put on shows and stuff like that, so we had entertainment. But we were not mistreated. Uh, I don't regret it. We were just lucky that that we were treated the way we were. So thank you for listening. I would just want to tell you that my parents did have a hard time on that railroad camp at first. They had a terrible boss. <laughs>